with them. How you been, man? I've been good. It's been, uh, it's been quite crazy. Um, it's been, uh, you know, working with COVID and everything else, trying to keep that together. It's been uh, quite a challenge. So, um, you know, when I wrote this, um, this last piece that we did, which was a proof of concept, um, I put it together to, to shoot, you know, in a diner, which is a set out in uh, a place called Palmdale, which is out in the desert. So it's about an hour away from where, where I live. And um, I had a small crew. We abided by COVID rules, had a COVID representative there, my medic, and everybody wore a mask. 12 hours. So somebody who complains about wearing a mask <laughs> in, a re- in a restaurant or uh, not a restaurant, but a, you know, a supermarket for 15 or 20 minutes, uh, I got to laugh at, you know, because yeah, 12 hours, a lot of hours. <laughs> we did it and nobody complained at all. No one was sick. No one got sick. You know, we just, uh, we stayed with it and uh, people were tested afterwards and everybody was clean. Negative. How how does that go as far as uh, they, they, how long you think before like uh, studios and will be comfortable enough to actually like start filming again? Because I know that some of them are, some of them are hesitant. Uh, how long you yeah. think before everybody's com- comfortable, comfortable and confident everything's going to be okay on the set? Well, right now they're saying September uh, and summer October, and then some studios are, are going to wait until January. So um, it really depends. And that's shooting here in the U.S. Because they're already shooting in, in Iceland and uh, in New Zealand right now. I mean, I, I, worked on, um, I worked on Avatar as a, a motion capture camera, one of the, uh, the camera uh, uh, men on that. And uh, they were, we were shooting here in Manhattan Beach. And then when they finished and they went down, they went to New Zealand, shut down for a little while, and, and they're back up because they're, you know, they're pretty much isolated, you know, but uh, I, I think, you know, it might go till January. It, it just might, depending on how states start abiding by the rules, you know, and, um, and wearing a mask and letting, letting this curve, you know, letting, getting past that curve of what's happening, you know, because there's, I've lost two friends to it. I've had three friends that got it. And, you know, when I hear people say, well, they must have had some underlining, you know, other medical, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, something that was something else that was before this happened, you know, some other medical problem. And they didn't. One was 43 years old. One was 51. So we were very, very cautious about what we were going to do when we had the, uh, the COVID team. We went in and doused the entire set. The set is a, a movie ranch which is out, like I said, out in Palmdale. So it's a diner, but it's not an active diner. And it's just built for, for you know, strictly shooting. And we had, we had went in, made sure they cleaned everything down. Anytime anybody came in and uh, sat down somewhere, we wiped it off afterwards. Not one crew member. We warned everybody too in the safety meeting, you pull off your mask, we have to stop for 45 minutes. And we have to, you know, wherever you moved, whatever you did. So. I didn't have a problem, and um, we got we had two days of shooting. Did you have people? Did you have people tested beforehand too? Yeah, everybody everybody tested beforehand. Uh, how everybody do you t- go about that? Do you like co- contact like the health department about that, or, or do- like yeah, a private doctors? Pl- or well, there's some places that that, that test, and um, through our insurance, which is Motion Picture, we're able to find you know certain places that they tell you you can get tested here or there, and sometimes they take. A few days, some you know. Sometimes it's forty-eight hours, you know. Um, but we were all tested prior to it, and then when we got there, we abided by the rules. And then after it was over, people got tested, and you know, I got these emails saying, "I'm negative, I'm negative, I'm negative." So it was, it's been good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's a scary town, man. Like you don't, you don't, you, you, we don't know what's going to happen, really. You know, like we just speculate at this point, but anything can happen within the next few months. Right, right. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I, you know, it's it's kind of freaky in places that um, there's people that are, you know, close to each other without a mask. You know, and that that kind of bothers me. But, you know, it's. I, I think I think that it will get through it if we can just 
all get together and do the right thing for it, you know? And by that time, it'll be out. I'm just a little nervous about school opening, you know? I, I'm taking my glasses off. I have two sons that are, um, that are twins and they're going to school and two separate schools. And if they, um, you know, it, I, I'm just concerned about how many kids are gonna be in the class, where, they, where those kids go when they're home, when they come back, you know, if there's someone that's, that's mm. sick at home. I, I just read this thing in Florida about uh, a kid who said, don't worry, I'm okay, I'm okay, don't worry, my friends are, are gonna be okay. He went out, came home, gave it to his father, and his father's, uh, you know, in intensive care and uh, doesn't look good. I'm sure that kid feels guilty, but this is what we have to deal with, you know? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, ho hopefully things calm down between now and September, you know, this, but again, we, nobody really knows. It could, it could either spike or uh, keep going down. So we'll see what happens, I guess, in the next few months. Um, yeah. how is, how is your, your, um, your, um, creative work as far as the, in the pandemic itself, do you, do you feel like you got more time now that then when everything shut down time to actually like start doing more creative work, uh, writing, more writing, more uh, prep work, or does that, like, did that help you in any way to have that downtime? Yeah. As soon as we went down, I started making a plan what, what I needed to do. And uh, I was in the midst, I had just, I'd finished the script and I created a lookbook for it. And um, I was ready to go out with it because we, we actually raised money for it. We had an actor and then um, the actor um, wanted to make some changes on it, which we did. And then uh, the pandemic hit. So I put it down and then I was in the midst of another script that I was writing and I said, all right, I'm going to try to get on that. But then something hit me about, you know, doing a, a, doing a series, which I wanted to do, you know. And uh, I wrote a um, sort of like a Twilight Zone. And um, I started getting into it. I wrote the backstory for it. I wrote um, several ideas for, you know, for the other episodes. And then I said, let's concentrate on one episode where I can actually shoot it and, you know, write maybe 13 or 14 pages as a proof of concept. And uh, I did that. I storyboarded everything. And, um, and then upon uh, finishing that, we raised the money. Um, I had a, a producer that she and I worked together talking. She was an actress, or she is an actress. We talked about doing something earlier. She came to me and she said, well, what, what can we do? And I pitched this story and she said, let's do it. And uh, she went out and raised the money. I got two other friends of mine that are producers. Uh, uh, they put everything together. We got the location. I got the actors, friends of mine. I actually had an actor who's a, a wonderful actor. He was in, his name is uh, Corey Hardick. And he was in uh, Battle of Los Angeles. He was in Outpost, which is a movie out now. He's been in a bunch of films and um, he was doing, he was ready to go. And then two days before, um, there was an actress that was, uh, that was missing here in California, I think. Yeah. From, yeah. Well, she's his wife's best friend. And he called me up and he said, I, I, Mike, I, I can't do it. I said, look, it's only a movie. Don't worry about it. We'll move on. And you and I will work together again at some point. And I stayed in touch with them, trying to find out what was going on, you know, and, uh, and then they found the body, you know, which was tragic. Yeah. But um, I got another friend of mine that, uh, that stepped right into the role. And ironically, this same exact thing happened to me when I did my very first film, which was uh, Second Dance, the one that went to Sundance. And uh, I had the lead actor um, backed out at the last second. And uh, I ended up having someone step in and he did a great job. And the, new, and the actor that stepped in here did a great job as well. So, Sometimes uh, it's just meant to be, right? It's meant, meant to happen yeah. that way, so. Exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, the ca I had another actor by the name of Jan Birch, who is, is in uh, a lot of horror films and uh, thrillers. And he and I, he actually came to read for me for The Hatred. And, um, and I wanted him at that time. But um, we were deciding back and forth on, uh, on another actor, which, uh, you know, was uh, Andrew Devoff. And Andrew wanted to do it. So, um, and he had worked with the producer before. So I told Jan, 
we're going to do something someday. And I picked up the phone when I was ready to do this. And Jan answered and said, let's go. I'm, I'm ready. So uh, it was a great it was a great experience, you know, with the crew and, and challenging with COVID, as I said. But, yeah. um, you know, having the time that was down, the downtime, and be able to write and, and be in solitude here, I was able to, uh, to put it all together. So now we're putting it together and we're actually going to meet with, uh, with Netflix uh, about it. So fingers what's, crossed. What's the story about this one? The, um um, no. I'm not going to give you too much. I'll give you enough to. No, just a, yeah, it's just a synopsis or something. Just a. Um, you know, I, I love thrillers. I love sci-fi thrillers based on, you know, some reality and whatnot. And it's about a guy who um, was blessed or, you know, he's got a, a very high IQ, but uh, something had happened to him when he was a child. And both his parents had died. And um, when he, they were in the woods, and uh, they had been driving through the forest and the car went off the road and the kid was missing. The kid doesn't know where five days went. And in doing that, you know, someone had adopted him and uh, somebody like Jeff Bezos. Anyway, he grew up and he has this Notre Nostradamus uh, uh, gift where he can tell the future, future yeah. the immediate future. And he's able to, to see someone like I would be, you know, at a restaurant, and I'd see you and you know, you would think I was crazy. And I'd say, look, you, you, I've got to tell you this. And then I have to give you a book and you have to sign it. You sign in and then you're on your own and you go through this process and you got to come up with, you know, a plan. And then when that is over, you have to sign out. And I always wanted to do a whodunit, but this is not a whodunit. It's a who is a, who's about to do it. You know, who's going to do it. And you have to figure out because in this story, there's several people that could possibly do what was predicted. And, and it's going to be something where like every episode is a different case or a different story, right? Yeah, the same guy, the same, it's almost like he's the host, but right. he's the same character that walks around with this book and meets you. And right. then you've got to go off and do it. Kind of like the, the, wasn't there, a, um, what's it called? A, a Dead Angel or something? Wasn't there a sh show kind of like that? Um, um not not exactly like that, but like um, I can't remember exactly what it was called. But it was a movie first uh, with Christopher Walken, I think, was the lead, and then they did a show in the early two thousands um, where the person was in a, was in a coma and then came back. Uh, what about the Dead Zone? Yes, Dead Zone. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, Stephen King. Yeah, he would he when he come in contact with somebody, he would tell the far future. Right, and right. It's different. Literally, yeah. it's different. But like, it's the same style where he's he's the lead or he's the main character in every episode. There's a new case and new challenges, yeah. and he has to overcome them, sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. This I wanted to create more of a, a Twilight Zone feel. Right. And, um, and I, I think we captured that in you know in this, um, and it has to happen right then and there. So wherever wherever he goes in, he, and they have to make a decision on what's going to happen. So if he meets someone at night. He's going to tell them before you go home, you've got to, you've got to do this. And that's how this happens. That gives you more intensity, right? Like gives you more of, we got to get, get this situated now or get this, this uh, problem solved now or else bad stuff right. is going to happen. So it gives you more of, of a limited time. So more intensity and more drama. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And there'll be episodes where people don't, don't sign it, don't believe it. And something happens, but there, when you sign it, you have, you have two paths. You either take the right path or the left path. And if you take, if you take, if you do sign it and you go on it, you still have to come up with a plan, you know, and you have that opportunity. It's not saying, it doesn't necessarily say you are going to be saved. You have to make a plan. You can't sit on your laurels and say, okay, let's see what happens because your demise is imminent. Mm -hmm. You know? Have you been following the, uh, the new Twilight Zone, Jordan Peele's? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't have the app to see it yet. I mm. heard that they were, they were, they were good. Have you seen it? I, 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 I watched the first season and then they, uh, if you go on Amazon prime, they gave the second season first episode away for free. Okay. So that's worth checking out. It's pretty good. Yeah. Um, the first season, it, it kind of paralleled like black mirror for me. Like it, it was like really, really strong stories. You know, yeah. I, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend it. Yeah, I'll, I'll look into it and, and check it out. Yeah, absolutely. 
It's uh, um, I, I was always a, a Twilight Zone freak when I when I did the uh, my first film, Second Dance. It was based on uh, Twilight Zone, you know, and um, and I just there is something about the short format about packing all that information in to 15 minutes, you know, and uh, and I, I, I love that. I love uh, getting people on a ride and you're on the edge of your seat, you know, and you start going one way and it goes another. Mm -hmm. I enjoy that. You, uh, you, you mentioned that you were working on Avatar 2. I know, I'm sure you signed all kind of NDA so you can't talk, really talk to us about anything there, uh, but you, you want to talk to us a little bit about the experience of working with uh, James Cameron and uh, and how how was how was that experience overall? Um, he's brilliant, and um, and he sees the world. You know, when we were shooting, you know, we were shooting on a stage where you know I was, we were capturing things, and uh, I, you know, I always heard that you know James knows everything about everybody's job, and he knows everything about camera. And if he's writing something, you know, you rightly so, you're going to say his dialogue. And um, I was filming this scene and my friend Mark Brown is the, uh, you know, is the DP for motion capture. And um, I was supposed to uh, uh, shoot Sam Worthington, you know, where they said, uh, Mark had said to me, catch him cowboy, which is from the head to the holster. And, um, and it was like a two or three minute scene. And, and I, uh, I remember I was filming him and, and he finished the scene, he finished his part before the scene was over. Instead of me shooting the floor or the ceiling, I just went to another actor, you know, Sigourney Weaver, or whatever. And uh, James came up and was looking at the, you know the, the shots and said, "Why is Kehoe on so and so?" And I said, "Oh, shit. oh no!" <laughs> and, I, and, I, and you know, uh, Mark came over and said, "So what, what?" And I explained to him. I said, "Look, um, as a filmmaker myself, I was on the, the actor selected, but then I." When he went out, I just decided to pick up another actor. Nothing was said. It wasn't, okay, I understand. It's just move on to the next. Oh, you know, man. So it was a wonderful experience to watch a filmmaker of that stature yeah. in action. And, um, and I, I got to tell you, I, I, I was so blessed to be there for a couple of weeks that I was there and, um, and watch what was going on. Going on. But um, it's going to be spectacular. You know, and uh, the world that he created is is amazing. And they they were shooting again. I know you can't tell us a lot, but um, they were shooting like two. I heard there's rumors are they were shooting two movies at the same time, right? Two and three. Is that confirmed or is it still just rumor? Um, you know what? I was only working on two, and I, I have no idea what what else was going on. You know, I'm sure that you know there's articles and things, you know, interviews with people and what you know what they're doing but he's dedicated his life to this and um uh, you know it was uh, like i said it was uh, an honor or I, I was like a kid in a candy store yeah know, watching him just watching him deal with actors because he's spot on when it comes to the technical side and he's spot on when it comes to talking to actors and uh, i just watched him in action and i was saying wow amazing really amazing so, uh, you know, I've been fortunate to have these moments, you know, in time to uh, witness that, you know, and uh, be on the set for that. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. Um, I see you wearing an Ithaca shirt representing yeah. the... Yeah. <laughs> you, want, you want to tell us a little bit about how, how you uh, how you start? You, you lived um, for a while here in Trumansburg, am I correct, in the area here? Yeah. Well, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, and then my family moved up to Trumansburg. I didn't know a soul, and, um, you know, I, everybody there was very, very warm and, uh, and open. You know, when I, I've made so many friends. I've had, I had friends that, um, that I'm still close with, all those people that I graduated. And then I was in a rock band, and we played, um, you know, we played for a few years, I think from like 1976. Till I, till I graduated, you know, and then uh, I, I went down to Manhattan to go to school. And then I moved out to California in 81. But the band, we got together every four years to play. So I still, you know, go back there. But Ithaca had such an impact on me and Trumansburg as well. 
that it was, um, it really opened my eyes. I mean, I was, in, when I was living in Brooklyn, I remember going to, to the theater and seeing uh, a James Bond festival. And I saw, I think three or four, I snuck into the theater actually to see it and see three or four James Bond movies. And um, I knew then that I wanted to get involved in, in the business, but it wasn't until I got to Trumansburg and Ithaca that I really got inspired by, um, by theater. And I, I uh, directed a play, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, there. I actually played McMurphy. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. Yeah, yeah. And, and I directed it. And I, I, it was the first time. I, didn't, I, I never knew what a producer did. And I, I, inadvertently, I was a producer not knowing what the job of a producer was. And so this is a great story. I was in, um, I made the deal with uh, the Booster Club. I said, I'll direct a play. They said, well, you have, uh, uh, you have X amount of time to do it, to prove yourself. And if not, we're going to pull everything away. So I got the school, but I could only have the school from three o'clock till five o'clock. That's two hours. So for rehearsals, building set, that's not a lot of time. Yeah. So there was a, uh, uh, there was a janitor that would take a break during school and I would, I went in and saw him and he didn't want to be bothered to do anything on his lunch. And I said, and his name was Al. I said, Al, I left something in the auditorium. Can I, can I get the key and I'll, I'll bring it right back to you? Yeah. Pulls the key off, gives it to me. I go out to my car. I drive down to the local lumber shop and it said, do not duplicate on the you know, key. And one of the guys that, um, that worked there would always come into the bowling alley where I used to, where I would work, you know? And so I knew them and I was holding the key and I was talking to him and he kept reaching for the key and finally just took it. And he's looking at me, he says, I gotta, I want to get this done. And he carved, you know, cut the key for me and gave it to me, drove back, gave the key back to Al. Now I had a key to get in there. So I got this guy, Alan G, who's a really good friend of mine from high school. And the two of us, we would go in there we start building the set. Mind you, Alan had an accident where he was working with some fireworks or something, I don't know, and got, he ruined his hand. So he had no hand. So I had a one-handed grip with me, <laughs> and him and I put it together. And God, he could do the work of three people. So we would go in there. They would come to kick us out. We would go into the parking lot. We'd wait. And then when everybody was gone, we'd sneak back in, and we worked till like 11 o'clock at night. And we built the set. And um, then I, when I was casting, I said, okay, how do I bring all these people in? Well, in upstate New York, where are the biggest crowds? Where are the biggest crowds that go to see Watt for high school? So if you're, if you're in high school, right? Yeah, yeah. And all the sports and everything else, what has the biggest crowd? Football. Football, yeah, there so you go. I, yeah. So I cast all the football players oh my as crazies <laughs> in the play. We had a packed house every night, and it went on for a couple of weeks. And they normally had, you know, Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday, and then they uh, they end it. We went two weeks and we packed the house every night, you know. And the guys who were, you know, the guys who were in football was, oh, you know, would never never think of being in a play. And you know, there's always these clicks that they that they pick on people like that. Not this, they had a ball and, and it went great. And that's what taught me about doing that. So when I came to LA, I started writing right away and got into it, you know. Um, and then, I, you know, being an independent filmmaker and bartending, because that's what I did through college, you're not making a lot of money, you know. And yeah. uh, I got my brother into craft service and uh, he pulled me in. I ended up getting the velvet handcuffs, you know, for this. And I was with Tom Cruise and J.J. Abrams and traveling around. And then I would take time off, make a movie, go back to it. And then, um, you know, traveling around. I got to travel around the world, you know, on Last Samurai. I went to uh, Japan and uh, New Zealand on Mission Impossible. I was in China. Uh, I worked on Blade Runner. I was in Budapest. Oh, just so, the craft services for those, or was there actual? I oversaw. I oversaw it, and and working, you know, working in that. But I got to when I, while I was there, I took advantage of getting involved in uh, some of the independent market that was there for films. So when I made a movie, I contacted those people, 
and went out. When I was in Korea, I got in touch with, you know, the Korean expat uh, film festival and, and my film went in there. So it was always, you know, I always had this, this sense of think ahead, you know, make sure that you, wherever you're at, make contact with people and see what you can do. So uh, yeah, by that point, you had like already a network of people you already met and talked to over the years. So maybe yeah. easier transition from crafts to actual um, making yeah, I was, stories. I was, and I was balancing both. Yeah. The, the, the craft service side was, was actually my income to supplement, you know, the, uh, the filmmaking whenever right. I wanted to do it. You know, I went to Dubai and, and on Mission Impossible and uh, actually made contact with the film festival there and got some great, you know, opportunities. I met the, uh, the king or the prince, you know, who was there. And there's a picture of me shaking his hand, which people say, how did you, how did you meet him? <laughs> you know, I was in the right place at the right time for a lot of these things, you know? But I'm very grateful to the people who brought me on, you know, to these places because uh, without them, you know, it is, it's who you know, but also it's in what you can do with it if you could do something, you know? And everyone that's, that's, has been able to open a door for me, I, I'm extremely thankful. Would you say that the world of filmmaking is a nurturing one or is it like uh, you have to kind of know what you're doing every time you show up on set? Like, does the crew carry you or are you in and on it? You're alone. Are you talking about from a director's standpoint? Um, anything like uh, entering the independent world of filmmaking. Um, if I was to become a, a cinematographer and this is my first film, or if I was a director, is it a nurturing environment or is it cutthroat? Um, if someone was asking me how I should do it, I would say, if you want to be a cinematographer, I would say work as a, um, as a camera assistant first. Learn that camera, watch mm -hmm. what's going on, get involved in that, and then you do it. My, my DP, his name is John Connor. He was on The Revenant. Um, he was, uh, to me, one of the most important or most difficult jobs on a film is a focus puller. And yeah. um, especially when they were working on film, because, you know, if you finish that day and you're looking at dailies and you're saying, holy shit, that's out of focus, you know, they're going to fire that guy, you know, and in The Revenant, everything was one shot. And so John had, you know, his work cut out for him. So I, I think, you know, the, the movie business is like high school with money. And um, you, you know, if you're in high school and you're studying and you're doing well, and you're in that crowd, you could be the head of that crowd and you're moving. If you're stupid or not even stupid, just ignorant to the fact that you need to, you know, learn about what's, what subjects and what's going on, you get invited to those parties or to the gatherings. And, um, and that's what it's like to me in that sense. There are, there are people who pay it forward. Um, and that's, I've learned from that because my first job and the business was given to me by a writer producer. And um, he took me, literally took me out of bartending. And uh, I, went, I went to work on a movie called um, Iron Eagle. And uh, I was a kid, you know, but I learned about everything, you know, for, for filmmaking on that, because I wanted to get involved. I went and, and watched the editor. I went and I watched camera. Um, Adam Greenberg was the DP. He shot a little movie called The Terminator. So, and that was before the Terminator. So I was watching, everything was going on, the special effects, what they did for it. I assisted the producer afterwards. And, you know, you just have to have an open mind and you have to watch that. It's, you're, you're more fortunate if you get involved in a film, in a studio film, even as a PA. But sometimes as a PA, you know, you're directing traffic, you know, a mile away with a radio. And uh, I think getting involved in camera or um, any of those departments, even as a grip, or an electrician, or set dressing, as long as you can be on set during those times, I think you do learn a lot. And there, as, as I said, there are people that are nurturing. There's cutthroat, what I find in cutthroat is the very independent films where people just don't want you around. You mm -hmm. know, they're very controlling, you know, but there's some independent films that are remarkable and extremely creative. And um, I always said that there's, Three kinds of filmmakers. You know, when you hear people say, oh, that's so Hollywood. Well, Christopher Nolan is Hollywood. Steven Spielberg is Hollywood. 
J.J. Abrams is Hollywood, you know, John Krasinski's Hollywood. So there's that Hollywood. Then there's the independent Hollywood that makes it to there. And then there's the desperate Hollywood, the people who use that name and abuse people that I don't want to be involved with, you know. Mm -hmm. I always, uh, um, I try to, I look at independent films. There's some remarkable independent films that are out there, even on Netflix or Amazon or Hulu. And, um, you know, you learn from it. I, to me, as a director, uh, um, you learn from everybody else's films. Sometimes you steal from everybody else's films. You know, you, you copy things and you try to enhance it in such a way where it looks like something of yours, you know? But there's a lot of new filmmakers now that have never seen, you know, um, The Third Man or Rear Window, you know, <laughs> any of the Hitchcock films. They don't even know who, you know, uh, Spencer Tracy is. And I think it's important to, you know, look at the Kurosawa films and, um, and you know, even French films. You know, the French developed these great things about cutting where we used to shoot films where a guy pulls up, gets out of a car, goes all the way up, opens the door, and then we're inside with him. And they shot all of that. We're in France. They shot him getting out of the car. He's walking up. You see him go out the door. And we cut to inside and the door's opening. So all that fat, fat was cut, you know? And there were, there was American filmmakers that did that as well, but the French did that early on. And I, I just think that it's important to learn, you know, so much about other filmmakers and, and get involved with those, you know? And, you know, you, you, can, you can move up uh, um, quickly and sometimes not so quickly, but there's a friend of mine, his name is BJ McConnell. He came up as a grip. He got, he got involved as a steady cam operator. He became a, a camera operator and then um, started directing. And now he's directing a movie for the Foo Fighters, uh, oh. which they're wow. doing right now. So, um, and I love him. He's extremely talented. But, you know, he started out as a grip, mm -hmm. which, which is still a great job. I'm not, I'm not putting it down. But it just goes to show you that you get yourself in and then you start to pick and choose. It used to be craft service was a a position that serviced the crafts. That's why they did it. It wasn't food. So anybody, when you talk to someone, you find out and say, so tell me what craft service is. If you say, well, they do all the food and the snacks. It's not what it was. And it's not even in the rule books in the union. They're there to service the other crafts. So if somebody needed a cable pulled or set dressing needed somebody, or you know they needed somebody for some other department, they would call a craft service person to come in there and do that. But then craft service evolved and I blame my brother for that because he's the one that really made changes for it. But, uh, but you know, he, he turned it upside down or, or right side up in such a way and it became a, a, um, a big income for those departments. However, now that's going to change. Because of COVID, I believe what's going to happen is they're going to have French hours. It's going to be 10 hours a day and they're not going to break. You'll get, you'll get um, the caterer will make food all day. Craft service will be there, but not in the capacity that it was. And um, it'll make the filmmakers um, to be more uh, creative in the sense where we now have to create our day. We have to be on the mark. We can't take, we can't take up too much time. You know, they really have to develop themselves to understand that, you know, which we all do time is money. And uh, you know, that's the two things that I always say, I wish we had more of was time and money. Yeah. Uh, you, you said something about independent and studio uh, films. Um, do you think that a lot of studio films that get, are um, uh, limited as far as what they can do creatively? Because when you, when you look at some of the new independent films and some of the studio films, you see a lot of rehashed, a lot of uh, same stuff happening, same uh, style and same story, stories told over and over again in the studio side where – a lot of independent filmmakers try to think outside the box to get some of the um, different stories or unique stories out there. Um, yeah. Do you think, and you could say that like a lot of studio films are, are, are um, uh, driven by money, driven by success uh, financially, where a lot of independent filmmakers just want to get their arts out, they want to get their, their, their stories and their ideas out there for people to get, for them to get recognized. Do you think that hinders the creativity for studio films versus independent films? You know, it depends. I mean, Netflix has some great art, you know, great films. 
and um, and there are studios that they go into that. I think what ends up happening is some studios will look at older films and say, hey, look, this did really well back then. Maybe we can recast it, you know, reshape it and utilize that and do something, you know, um, for for today's people. Because like I said earlier, there are director, filmmakers and people have never seen some of these films that we talk about, you know, um, like The Third Man or Rear Window or films like that. You know, some people don't even know who Stanley Kubrick is. So, mm-hmm. you know, when they when they remake those, I don't think that they're they're just saying, "Come on, we can make money." And maybe there's some are some are that way, but I think what they're they're thinking is, you know, they they had the success years ago for this. Why don't we try to see if we could, you know, create something and update it in such a way? It's look look at look at the Camaro. The Camaro was made in 1967, 68, and 69. That shape there. Then it went, you know, to hell, as far as I'm concerned. And then you didn't see it for a while. And all of a sudden, when it came back, it was the same looking, same car as the look of the 1969. And everybody bought it. So if you take that that concept, you know, you you are you may be rehashing something. And there are people that have seen those those films and say, oh, geez, they can't they be, be creative, you know, can't they do that? But I think it's that concept of, you know, I'm going to update it, you know, with all the new bells and whistles. And, um, you know, I wanted, there's a movie that I wanted to make, remake, and um, although I was upset, I was extremely happy to learn. My hero uh, years ago was Walter Hill. And, um, and I got to be on the set watching him work, you know, staring at him. And there was a movie that I saw as a, as a kid called Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Have you ever seen it? No. Shame on you. <laughs> so it's with uh, Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. It's a thriller and it's so good. And Betty Davis is so great in it. And um, I was saying, oh my God, it scared the hell out of me as a kid. So I thought, you know what? About maybe, this was maybe four years ago, maybe, or so. And I said, I'm going to start doing some research because I want to remake this movie. And Warner Brothers, I think, owned it. So I started doing the research and I called a friend of mine. He said, dude, stop where you, stop where you are. I said, why? He said, because Walter Hill and um, Ridley Scott are doing the remake. Oh, man. <laughs> Which is fine because it's in some great hands. Yeah. But you know, this is what I mean. That movie, you've never seen the movie. But if you see the new one coming out, so you'll say, oh, shit, wow, wow. You know, this is, this is great, you know? Uh, some, of, some of them work. Some of the remakes work. Uh, work yeah. But, um, you know, when, they, when, when you see it happening every year, a lot of people start to question, like, is it, I mean, a lot of people are, are craving for new stories and new, new um, ideas and new cr- creative work. When you rehash the same things over and over again, some stories, are, I, I get it, meant to be retold, especially if it was made uh, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, then with the new technology and, and how films look now, it's only fair to, to actually remake it and make it uh, let, let other people see it in a different light. Uh, yeah. But like doing it too much, it just becomes little, you know, it, it waters down everything. So like there's everything is being told over and over again. It seems like there's no more stories to be told, which is in fact natural because if you look at a lot of independent films, there's a lot of creative people out there doing a lot of work. Um, so that, that's why like it, it's just... Uh, surprises me that that not many studios uh big studios i'm not i don't know netflix does a lot of independent stuff too which is great like it gives a lot of opportunities to new filmmakers to do uh creative work uh but like if you look at uh bigger ones like disney or wb or all the big ones um they just seems like they're, they're doing a lot of stuff over and over again um, yeah well i mean look there are films that i would not remake and i always said i it shouldn't be remade would be like gone with the wind um, Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, um, and I thought even uh, the Wild Bunch. Have you ever seen the Wild Bunch? Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, all the so, time ago, yeah. Yeah, well, they're remaking that, and Mel Gibson is directing it. So, oh, wow. hmm. um, you know, I I think Jerry Bruckheimer is uh, producing it because I know my buddy Tommy Harper, I think, was supposed to be on that. But you know, I think what it's what's going to take is these new young filmmakers, or even you know filmmakers that they ne- not, don't necessarily have to be young. They just have to think out of the box 
and create things and do things that are completely different. You can have a style that, you know, emulates another style, but you want to, you want to have your story told um, in such a way that you can do it. There are only seven stories, as they say in Hollywood. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back. Boy meets dog, boy loses dog, <laughs> boy gets dog back. You know, so you, you have to come up, come up with something that can still do that and change it in such a way, you know, where you call it yours and, um, and then it's never been done. There are films that are like that. You know, there are many films that are like that with up and coming filmmakers. So uh, it follows. Great film. You saw that, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, there you go. I mean, there's, there's being, you know, and, and what he did was they, they utilized the, uh, the look and the feel of Halloween and those films that were made in the seventies and gave it that feel with a whole new twist and a whole new story. Was that, was that, that was that an independent film or was that an actual studio film? No, it was independent. Right. It, right. So, so you see a lot of creative work in indie. Yeah. Films. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, you can take what was done years ago. Right. And create something now, but you gotta, but you gotta get away from the stories that were made years ago. Yeah. That, that's, that's my thing. And it, and I've seen that a lot with Disney too. Like they're, they're just milking a lot of it at this point. Like if you see um, like the Aladdin movies or the, the Lion King and are those already told in a beautiful way? Like the originals are still really good to, to today. Um, redoing them is just, just make it, make it look, makes it look like you're just basically at one and well, the money would, in there. You and I would say that. However, right. the kids that are three or four years old that never saw the other one are now seeing something new. And the kids that are that saw the first one want to see something else. You don't think so that, you know the people that are young like my son loves the Lion King and, and Aladdin. He's yeah. eight years old, so I, and and I think that relates to them more, right? Like the actual cartoons are, are something that the, all kids love. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I just it just feels like a lot of it is just a cash grab more than actual creative work, which I understand. Like you know what I mean? Like it's, if it's a business strategy, I get it. I just I hope that there's more to it than that. You know. Yeah, and I, I think that there are certain things that just shouldn't, like, you wouldn't want to remake Gilligan's Island. Right. You know, you wouldn't want to remake the Flintstones again. Not not for a feature, but even the cartoons. Yeah. Because they were, they were iconic, and there's something about them, the feel about it, you know, that uh, um, even the Bugs Bunny. Or, uh, to me, I was a little pissed off about the Little Rascals, you know, because the, the old Little Rascals, which you, your children should see, yeah. um, they were classic. The Three Stooges, you know, yeah. you you tried to make the short form Three Stooges today. No one would laugh, but the way that they were done back then in black and white, and the cruelty that was done, you know, to 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 each other, you know, on that, well, you know, to the to the characters uh, that were there, the Mo, Larry, and Curly, it was just it was phenomenal stunts and and things that you couldn't do, and you you got away with it, but to remake those. They did remake the Three Stooges, though, didn't they? Like a few years ago. Yeah, and it failed. Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Some of these things should not be remade. Yeah. You know, just they're classics in the sense of classic. It's like saying taking a Charlie Chaplin movie and try to do it now. Like, that's not going to work, right? No. Just, if you're going to do the character, like, you know, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, portrayed him, then that's different when you do a, right. you know, a, a biography, you know, story on him. But... Um, uh, yeah, I agree with you 100%. I just think that there's there's enough filmmakers now coming up with new ideas. And because of the new platforms, you know, we're looking at all of these new platforms uh, that, uh, platforms that people get their content on. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great, um, I mean, it's a, hopefully it doesn't saturate the market too much. You know what I mean? Like if it's too, mu too many of these things and it's just going to be too, too many stories out there to watch. A lot of them is going to go unnoticed. You know what I mean? So hopefully, hopefully uh, it doesn't, doesn't become like that. And, and um, I don't know, I don't know how they're going to fix that to be honest, because everybody's trying to jump in and get their piece of the pie. So I have no, I have no solution for that. Or uh, what, do you, what do you think? What do you think that should happen to actually uh, fix that issue of saturated the market uh, as far as VOD goes? Well, I mean, I think, I think that, um, like I said, about these platforms, like what my idea is when I, when I 
not if, when I get this series rolling, I want to go back to Ithaca to shoot some of the episodes, you know? And what I'd like to do is inspire some of the filmmakers there and actually produce them. So I know, and I see, I already know what's going on in certain parts of Hollywood and know what to do. Because sometimes when you're not in that, you know, when you're not in that area, you're not in that circle, you create something that, has already been made and people say, well, you know, shouldn't do that. So I want to go back there, inspire some people and get some young, fresh voices to come out and their, their eyes to create some, uh, some content for that. So I think that, you know, there are people out there, producers out there that are trying to find that. JJ Abrams is great about giving opportunities to people. I, I mean, even Jason Blum from Blumhouse, same thing. And he allows his filmmakers to create, you know, um, that they, they give them a, a you know a map and and uh, they abide by that and they go out and make their movie. So you know you just have to have that story, that one story that's that's not like everybody else. But I think the thing to do is just keep writing, keep keep a file on your computer of all these different stories. If something comes into your head at night, make a file, put it in there, and make sure you put the notes in there because so one day you go back and say, I don't even know what this is. What is this? Yeah. You know. And you've got you've to give yourself enough detail because our minds are actively, you know, churning everything. We're thinking about, as a director, you're thinking about the actors, you're thinking about writing, you're thinking about story, thinking about camera, and then all of a sudden something comes for you, to you, you've got to put it there, but you've got to make the notes. And if you don't do that, then you, it sits there and you say, oh, shit, ah, I gotta throw it away. That could have been your, you know, award-winning, TV show, feature film, whatever. And you just didn't, you know, you, it came and it went. Mm -hmm. You know? I was reading your um, treatment for the Defiant one. Um, that was like really, I saw the whole thing, like uh, the way you laid it out in that treatment. Like I, I've never seen a treatment like that before. That's probably how you're supposed to do it. But that that was really cool to see that. Well, you know, I try when, when, if I'm looking at something and I'm creating something, you know, it's theater of the mind. And so I see, I see the lights go down. I see the screen come up and I want to um, create something that you will see. And so when I'm writing, I'm trying to give you a vision of what I'm actually seeing in my head. And I think um, when I created the lookbook for that, I think that was, um, something I, I tried to grab. It's almost like making a commercial. Sometimes, you know, the commercials have these spot, these moments in there that connect, but you know, you might see a guy getting out of his car and then um, you see him somewhere else. You thought you saw him walking, but you didn't, you know, and it's mm -hmm. creating those images to weave them together to create that story, that through line that you're going to see. And um, I thank you for the compliment. You know, I, I was hoping that I, I could convey that. And uh, obviously it did, you know, and that, that's what I would tell people, you know, I, I, there's a young filmmaker that's, that's doing a proof of concept now. And that's one of the things that I'm telling him, you've got to create a lookbook in order to do it. Because a lot of times what you have is studio execs may not want to read the script. They may say, here's the script. I'm going to give it to an assistant. They're going to read it and then we'll see what happens. Then the assistant, you know, some like vanilla and some like chocolate, some like strawberry, some like pistachio. This one in particular didn't like pistachio. You created pistachio, but somebody else may. So that's why you want to put a lookbook together to get a visual sense of, of what it is. There are some friends of mine that do a, uh, um, an actual previs creating uh, um, a computerized you know, version of a scene to do that. And, and you get movement in that. I'm not that talented to do that. And I can't afford to hire somebody on that, you know? So, um, but you know, that's why back in Ithaca, there are artists there. And to me, if I was, if I was back there right now, having the knowledge that I had back then, I'd say, okay, I'm going to make a film and I'm going to write it. Who do I know that's in art school at Ithaca? That's really good. I want to go see all their stuff. And then you go to them and say, Hey, do you want to put something on your resume? You want to do this? I may give you 50 bucks because that's all I got. You know, do this and you got this on your resume to do for a film. 
they do it. They get a storyboard. Now you've got that. And you can go out and get, go take pictures. Normally what I do is, I'll tell you what, if you give me a moment here, I'll turn this light up and I'll show you. I'm not the greatest artist, but I did my own storyboards. So give me a second here. Yeah. While we're waiting, please uh, go and check out Spotify, our channel there, and listen to some of the episodes from before. It helps us a lot. Thank you so much. This commercial break brought to you by Diary of the Mouth. You know what? I don't, um, I don't have, I, I have, well, I have storyboards from, from, um, from the, the hatred. So I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. So yeah. what I did, you can see the bridge, right? Yeah. Bars on? Yep. So what I did was I went down to the bridge on the location. You go, I went to the location and then, and here's another shot of it. And I took a picture of it. And then by taking the picture, I drew that, you know, I had it on my iPhone and I just drew it and I put the characters in there. You could actually go out to a location and, um, and put actors in there, take the pictures and use the actual pictures, you know, and, and do it that way. But, um, I, you know, I, I tend to, I don't, you know, it's hard to go get everybody and, you know, get everybody involved and say, hey, I, I, need, I need five or six actors. You may, but you may not. The problem with that is you use them in the, uh, in the previous and then you don't use them in the film and, you know, you've cheated them. You know what I mean? Mm. So um, I just think that, you know, Ithaca College has, or even, um, even uh, uh, TC3 has creative people there that you could snatch up and help you with that, you know? Yeah. Uh, so you said a proof of some of a proof of concepts. What do you, walk me through it. What do you need to do to actually get to that? Like what, what, what is that entire, uh, entire thing goes like, like to get a, a proof of concept for, for a story? Well, I think what you want to do is um, you want to, if, if it's a series, let's just say it's a series, you want to take a, uh, an episode out of that series and you want to do a short film and you want to do it, you know, no longer than 15 minutes and no shorter than 12. And you want to have a beginning, a middle and an end. Five, 10, 15, four, eight, 12, you know, either way. And, you know, you set it up just like you would, you're shooting a short film and you do enough of it that people say, wow, I want to see more. And now you've had that concept. And what you do is you have the lookbook and you have the proof of concept and you have some episodes and then you could take it from there. What I'm, what I did was it's an origin story, you know, the, as far as for the lookbook, because this I, I started with this character when the character was extremely young, you know, maybe four or five years old. Lookbook is years, years later. Uh, I mean, I'm not the lookbook, but the, the uh, um, proof of concept that we filmed. And then the lookbook gives you ideas for the, uh, um, you know, for everything to cover everything, you know, for different episodes as well as the uh, the uh, origin of it, you know. So, but uh, writing, you know, writing a script is important for that. So did you? Okay, you you said you're working on a series right now. Uh, did you write when you when you uh, think of the idea? Um, did you end up writing the whole like season, or you just write the pilot, and then you basically uh, write down like the the ideas for the whole season, and then uh, presented that way we just write the actual pilot and then uh, like just the description of the actual or synopsis of the actual series well it started out with an idea about this guy who could actually tell the immediate future okay and then it expanded from there and so when i when i said okay this is what's going to happen this is what's going to go on um for you know for this the series for whatever and or or actually for the for that episode, and then what I did was I said, where did he come from? And so I created the idea of the family that he had, how he grew up, and where he got how he got to where he is today. So that filled in that space there, and then you know other ideas for other episodes because now I already had the backstory, and you know that this guy has this this you know this. Uh, um, this quality, this gift. So I just had to do, 
you know, those other episodes for that and different ideas. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to connect all the people that are in that room. Everybody has a story that ended up coming in there. And what I did on this was I met with the actors and I wrote a backstory for every actor. We weren't using them in that, but it gave the actors this, um, this great subterfuge that was, uh, that was being put forth you know, in the scene. For instance, there's a character, I'm not gonna give it away, but there's a character that I told, here's what's happening with you. People are gonna think you're a killer because you, you know, of what's going on with you and you're angry. And he says, well, why am I angry? And then I told him, I said, you own a ranch, someone shot your dog, the guy got away, you're bringing the dog to the vet and the, dog, the doctor said, just go away, we'll take care of him, we'll, we'll make sure that he's, he's gonna live, but you can't be here now. And he goes to this diner and sits there and he's got his backstory and he's working, but you don't know what he's thinking. Right. So if he's angry, you're thinking that he's, he's actually angry and something's going to happen. So I tried to piece that together to make everything, you know, somewhat like of an octopus, you know, and these tentacles are, are coming back in, you know, to the source of the story. And each one has a different story. So creating, um, creating the idea, the nucleus of the idea can branch off to, um, to other episodes to the origin of the character or characters. Um, you know, it's, um, I think it's important just not, you know, I think what's important is to tell stories with, um, with actors and um, an actor could be any color, any race, anything. And don't think of, I gotta have somebody who looks like Bruce Willis. Or I gotta have somebody who looks like Denzel Washington. Just get, write the role and fill the role in there with a great actor, be it Asian, be it black, be it white, be it, you know, red, green, purple, it doesn't matter, you know, and get the best out of that, of that actor, you know, or actress. And um, because sometimes, you know, when you're, when you're auditioning somebody, you have this preconceived notion of, uh, uh, okay, I'm looking at this character and I'm seeing Cameron Diaz, but then Lucy Liu walks in and blows you away and you say, forget it. So just keep an open mind when you're doing that. It helps the story, you know? Mm. So, but uh, you know, um, developing is the most important thing, you know, uh, uh, for you to, to have that time. And once again, it may be, it was a curse and a blessing having COVID, you know, because yeah. I had the time to sit here and, and, uh, and create. What are, for, for somebody, for the new filmmakers that, are, that have uh, went through all that, like they got the, they wrote the script, they, they filmed the pilot, um, what's the next step? Like, how do you actually pitch to uh, producers or, 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 you know, how, how do you go about, about actually getting the project uh, greenlit, just in general? Okay, well, first of all, you can't, like, if you had something that you thought let's say you had something today that you thought would be perfect for Netflix. Yeah. You can't send it to Netflix. Uh, you can't send unsolicited material to any production company or producer because what ends up happening is if you sent me something and I say, and I, I read it and after I've read it, I say, Oh my God, I have this story already here. And I send it back to you and I say, you know, I, I already have something. Then I go off and make it and you go out and say, I sent him my script. He stole the story, and you know I'm uh, I'm going to sue him. You can't do that. So the best thing to do is, you know, you um, you get a, an attorney or an agent, and they take the property and they present it because now it's protected, and then you know if they sign like an NDA for whatever, and they can read it and they can say to the attorney and to you, we already we do have a project and um, this project was that we created was created in 1995. You know, you wrote yours two years ago. So that's, that's the way to do it. You always have to have somebody that is going to sign something over to say, you know, I'm sending this to you and um, you know, this, I, I represent, you know, Mary or John or Billy or whoever, 
you know, they want to make sure that uh, it's protected. And the best thing to do too is register your script. You register it with, uh, I think if you go, if you, if you're on final draft, I think you register it for five or six years. Then the, the other thing to do is mail it to yourself and you know, you'll have the postmark. It's like a poor man's, uh, copyright. And if you want to get a copyright, you copyright, you know, yeah. but you know, I always either mail it to myself or I register it on uh, final draft and you want to keep that. They'll send you a certificate. And even though you're, the WGA, you're registering with the WGA. And even though you're not a member, they have the evidence that you did that at that point, you know? So um, having someone represent you is, is the best for that. Yeah, it seems a lot of, uh, it just seems like it's, sometimes it seems like it's hard to actually get into it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and I've, I've, I know some people here around here in the area that are so talented and it just, uh, it's kind of hard to like figure out how to to do it without uh, like sometimes you have to sacrifice a lot of things to get there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, I, I think you, I think one of the things that maybe filmmakers there should do is create a short film and get it into as many film festivals as yeah. possible. Someone's going to see that and say, I got to get in touch with that and then be active on, you know, on, on Twitter, on um, Instagram and Facebook, you know, and just promote your career. Don't put things up there like, oh, I threw up on my dog, you know, or I, you know, I, I locked myself out of the house. Here's me in my underwear. You know, it's just ridiculous. Just promote your career and what you're doing because eventually that's where you want to be. And being naked outside your house is not promoting your career. You know, I mean, unless, for, unless that's what you're going for, then yeah. It's, exactly. If you're doing a, <laughs> yeah, a YouTube star, you know, and how long does that last? Right. Yeah. So um, I, I would say, you know, utilize those platforms to, uh, to promote your career. And you know, listen, you're going to make a film, you know, filmmakers out there are going to make a film and um, some people are not going to like it. They're going to write terrible things about it. It's happened to me. You're going to get good and you're going to get bad. But don't let it weigh you down. Why is it that somebody says 10 great things about you and then they say one bad thing, that one bad thing outweighs the 10? Don't dwell on it. Just keep creating, keep pushing. And, um, you know, and, and things will start working. It, it's, you know, it's not an overnight thing by any means. Right. You know? So um, you can't give up. You know, I, I that's my motto. I don't, I, I'm, I'm not... It's like Cool Hand Luke, you know, if you ever saw Cool Hand Luke, he never gave up. You know, when he was down, he got back up, he kept getting beat up. And I think that's the way you have to think about your life. If you watch that movie, you're going to walk away from it saying, this is the attitude I have to have. Yeah. I have to just not give up on anything. So. Have, have you thought about joining the, uh, one of those um, apps where you, uh, like there's a, they go for like the 10, 15 minute series or 10, 15 minute movies. Um, I can't remember the last streaming one. What was the last one? Quibi, Quibi or something like that? Yeah, Quibi, yeah. Have, have you I thought actually, about doing stuff for them? Well, I actually know Meg Whitman from a, a, a while ago when I was, uh, when we were working on um, keeping work in California at that time. And Meg Whitman was uh, as a politician representative here in California. And my, uh, my uh, DP at the time, when we were doing a commercial for that, um, reached out to her. But at the time, I never knew that she was doing, going to do Quibi. And, um, you know, you, they, they do some incredible uh, content. I haven't downloaded it yet, but I don't know how long, and maybe it will last. But, you know, some people's attention is, is like this. Yeah. But the young generation is not going to pay for a subscription for that. When they already have YouTube and, you know, um, and Instagram and TikTok and things like that, you know, it's, I, I don't know what's, what's going to happen there for filmmakers. Maybe. Yeah. So those are free, right? YouTube is free. And a lot of people that just throw their, their short films and, and, uh, creative, creative content there for free. Yeah. Um, yeah. and Quibi is Quibi. You have to pay, right? Like $10 or something for it or seven ninety nine yeah, or something like that. Yeah, six ninety nine or seven dollars, whatever. But apparently, they have some great content, and it's yeah. Big I saw form. some trailers for it. Yeah, they have some big names attached to some of the some of the 
the series there. Uh, but I, I didn't watch any of them. But I, from what I saw, some of the some of them were just terrible. Some of them were just not done well. Um, not, not how they shot or anything. Just the stories were not um, were not told. I guess they were not good. I don't know. Um, but what do you think? Do you think that uh, stuff like that? Do you think that we, that the industry needs it right now, or, or are we saturated the market too too much? Everybody wants a different platform to do something different, right. whether it's uh, uh, YouTube or, um, you know, it's something, filmmakers just want to get their films shown. Yeah. Um, you know, if you say to your family, I want you to see this, you can see it on YouTube. Hang on a second. What is that? What is that? I'm going to leave it. Okay. My, it's my son. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you right later, Ryan. Um, I, I think, you know, if a filmmaker makes something and it goes and they paid for Quibi and they say, um, I want my aunt or my uncle in Iowa to watch this or in Louisiana and I'm living in New York or California and they don't have Quibi and they're never going to get to see it unless you send them a copy of something that you've already done. But, you know, they're not going to get it in the, in the, in the, in the, in, in the look that it is, that it is. So it's, uh, and besides, I don't think that the studio is going to give you something that you can actually go out and show somewhere because then they say, well, you're going to go out and show for free. And then, you know, we're losing out on the revenue uh, uh, for this. So, you know, it's, it's kind of hard. It's, it's tricky. You know, um, I don't know. There's, there's, there are people coming up with different ideas, you know, for seeing films. Look, the drive-ins are coming back. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome, though. I love, I love away, that. <laughs> they went away in the, what, in the 80s, yeah. and they're all, I, I think it's brilliant. I think it's know? awesome, yeah. Yeah, and I think people are going to, people are going to start saying, let's, let's do this, and it's because, you know, you got to make, you got to make lemonade out of lemons, and we got COVID, that's the lemon, and look what's happened, you know, because of that. So, um, you know, one of the things that I did was I created a, a water station for the movie set, where it's, uh, um, you know, you don't touch anything. And my partner and I did it. We had it on the movie set and everybody's saying, oh, wow, we got to get this. And we already have orders from some studios, you know, for it. And it was something that we, you know, I came up with a couple of years ago, started talking to this guy and then COVID hit and we said, bingo, time is right. What, what is that? Where is the water station? What does that do? It's a, um, you walk up to this water station, you put your water canteen down and you press with your foot and it fills it up with water. So it's not an igloo where everybody's got their, you know, their spout up, up against it. Yeah. You're not using bottled water because nobody wants to use bottled water anymore. Right. And you have this machine that is portable. It goes around, holds a hundred, hundred gallons. You could fill it with a garden hose and it has this filtration system inside of it. And it could be on set the whole day, giving you cold water instead of having bottles that are going to be thrown all over the place. You know, mm -hmm. so, um, that was something that we, you know, we came up with once again during COVID or before COVID, but COVID actually sparked the, um, the need for it. That's pretty neat. So, That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, I, you know, just, you got to be creative. You got to think of other things. You also want to supplement your income. I mean, I can't go back to bartending. I don't want to go back to bartending. And right now, most of the bartenders are women, you know? Yeah. So unless I put a skirt on, it's not going to happen. You know? <laughs> I mean, there might be some bars that would accept that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. But, you know, I, I, you know, I always want to pay back and I, I want to go back to Ithaca and I, and I want to, uh, I want to help other filmmakers, you know, well, we're from but, Ithaca. So, you know, well, you know, <laughs> and people, you know, people should follow me on, um, on Twitter, on Twitter. It's, uh, at Mikey Keo. I mean, they can look on, you know, uh, also Instagram, I think is, M I K E H O E one one. Yeah, I'll put yeah. it in the description for the episode. That will be people can just click on the link there and yeah, take a look. People, you know, the, the great thing about that is I get to see them. I see some of their content, and I, you know, I make a, I make a call to you know to them or whatever and find them out. I found actors like that. You know, I found uh, technicians like that. There's uh, um, the clip that I sent to you that you saw. Yeah, with the shot with the fish eye. Yeah. I mean, camera system that's extremely creative and I told him the next film I, I want to have you on so it's being you know that creative and innovative that you you catch the eye of somebody that 
could help you. I mean, it's what happened with me, you know, when I did the, um, when I did my short film, I, I shot it on, on uh, 35 millimeter. We cut it on a moviola and I, um, I screened it at Sony. And um, my, the producer was a friend of mine who produced Everybody's All American and a bunch of other movies. Uh, in fact, um, he was, uh, he, was a co he produced some comedy uh, shows. Anyway, he had said to me at the time, just screen it at Sony. You may get 50, 50 people and uh, see what happens. And I screened it at Sony and 500 people showed up to a 99 seat, a 99 seat theater. And I had to show it five times. And the um, projectionist, this woman, came down and said to me, Mike, have you shown the sentence to Sundance? I said, I actually did, uh, uh, and I was too late. She said, leave it here. I'm going to present it to John Cooper, who is now the head of Sundance. And he was the head of uh, um, shorts at the time. She said, let me, let me see what I can do. So I waited home. And about maybe a week later, UPS came and there's my film container, you know, the 35 millimeter. Yeah. In there. And I had a golden retriever at the time. And about two days later, I get a letter, all my mail. And I look and there's Sundance. And I said, it's a rejection letter. So I threw it down and I opened up everything else. And my dog's sitting with me. And my dog's looking at me. And I opened it up and I just started crying because I was accepted. And it was because of taking the risk, or not taking the risk, because of going out and doing that and paying for the theater and getting people to see it and having people talk. And this woman who, you know, she's responsible for igniting this fire that had happened, you know? Wow. And um, I just think that that's what has to happen. So there's always been somebody that's been there to help me. And I always want to be there to help somebody else. You got, you got to put yourself out there. So by you doing that, the universe basically rewarded you with something that's you wanted. So yeah. that's pretty, that's pretty inspiring. You know, you, you know, a lot of people will talk about the universe and say it's going to come to you. You can't you wait to, for it. You have to put yourself out there, yeah. You got to go. You got to be a hustler. You got to go get it. And, um, you know, I have a friend of mine who's in, in the, in the uh, proof of concept. His name is Sal Baker. You could look him up. He's an incredible actor. I met him when I was in New Zealand on Last Samurai which was in 2002. And he was a hustler. He was in Lord of the Rings. He played, what's the, what's the evil character with the ring? What's his name? So it starts with an S. I saw a guy on something like, saw, saw, yeah, yeah. Something like he, that, yeah. He, he played him, and that was the only shepherd you didn't see his face. He came to, to America, to California, and he hustled. He found <laughs> out where people were auditioning, and he went in and put his picture in there and his resume, and they said, you're not on the list. He said, oh, oh, yeah, I was told and I came in there. And he, he did it, you know. And he's been in every movie that you can think of. He's in Mandalorian on the, in the TV series. He's in everything. You say, oh, my God, I've seen him. He's been in 200 movies. Wow. All he does, he's a hustler. And that's what you got to do. You know, you just got to go out and go get it. Man, we could talk about this all night, man. This is this is great. Um, I appreciate you stop coming over and just uh, taking the time to talk to us, man. That, that's just, and I'm so excited for you, man. Like, there's so many things. Like, like you, you, you're gonna open the eyes to a lot of people around here, a lot of filmmakers and artists around here to actually get out there and and and, and put yourself out there and, and actually do something. Um, so I appreciate it. When when can people find you? I know you said Twitter. Uh, what what are some of the? Do you have a website or anything like or uh, Instagram? Uh, Instagram know, maybe. Yeah, Instagram is. Uh, I'll tell you right now what it is. I look at it. I didn't pay attention to. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, M I K E H O E one one. That's on Instagram, and then uh, Twitter is. Um, I'll tell you that right now. It, Twitter is is uh, M I K E Y. K E H O E, but it's at, at Mikey Keo. So my Facebook page is like getting filled up, you know, with people that yeah. is always you know, getting people on there. But um, you know what I would really like to do is, and you know, if you could set this up at some point, once this whole thing, you know, we get over this, I'm going to take a trip. I have to go back to see my family. I would love to do some sort of a, a Q and A at a theater or somewhere and bring in all the filmmakers and start talking to them 
and get a question and answer at seminar and do a panel with that. And I would love to, you know, have you guys host it. And then I'll, uh, I don't care how many hours it is, we'll do whatever we can to get people started, even if it's new or older people that are, you know, that have been doing it and just haven't had that chance. Um, let's make it happen. Yeah, I'm down. That will be actually really cool to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. definitely should do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm up for it at any time. Bye man. Thank you so much. I'll, uh, we'll keep in touch and I can't wait to see your, your, your new, uh, series. Keep me updated on that. Cause it seems really interesting. And I want to know more about it. Um, uh -huh. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. And we'll see you next time. All right. And, uh, believe me, as soon as it's cut, both you guys will see it and I'll make sure that you use it, but you got mum is the word until it's out. No, you know? what we'll do basically is what we'll do. Let's, let's, let's watch it. When, when you're done with it, send us a copy. We'll watch it. And when it's actually out, we'll do a, a, an episode just for that to talk about it. Great. Great. Sounds good. Yeah. That'd be an awesome thing to do. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Uh, Right. Thank you, both of you guys. Thank See you so later, much. man. Yeah. Thank you.